Nothing makes my friend and co-host John Shannon happier than talking hockey. Yeah. And I'm guessing since you spend so much time in Edmonton over the course of the hockey season, uh, I'm guessing you're very much looking forward to this discussion as the general manager of the Oilers, Ken Holland, joins us today. Well, to be clear, um, I don't think there's a better interview in the game of hockey, uh, at least from a manager's perspective, um, than Kenny Holland. Can't disagree. Uh, and so I, when he was in Detroit, he was a great conversationalist. The, the, the fascination thing about Kenny is, is that he's, he's one of those guys, if you send Kenny a text, the phone will ring. And the phone will ring is he says, I can't text you because you're going to, you, you, the nuance of what I'm trying to tell you won't make sense. So then, and, and, and my kind of guy, I, I hate texting. So, and, and the other thing is um, when you listen to Kenny speak, I, I will tell you that you hear a little bit of Scotty Bowman in him. And we've listened, we've had Scotty on enough uh, over the years too, Bob, to know that these, because these guys just, they love the game so much and they love to explain the game so much. And they have so much history in the game uh, that it's, it's fun to sit back and listen to them. And, and that's why he's, that's why he's such a great interview. Well, the other thing is um, while they have been in the game in, and I'm talking about Bowman and, and Holland, while they've been in the game all their lives, mm -hmm. they are not stuck in that rut of this is how we do it. And nobody's going to talk me out of it. I think both of them are open to the evolution of the sport and changes that, yeah. that, that may take place. And I, I respect that a great deal. Yeah. And, and I think Kenny has had, you know, he was in Detroit a long time, more than 20 years. And I think the last three years in Edmonton um, coming to a Canadian market has opened Kenny's eyes a little bit. Now Detroit was a tough place to play, but Detroit as an American market the passion for the Red Wings, I, I don't, I think is not near as the same as the passion for the Oilers in Edmonton. Uh, I mean, Kenny can't go to the corner store and, in, in the suburbs or downtown in Edmonton without being, I'm sure, uh, yelled at. Yeah, or yelled at. Yeah. And, and, and yelled at saying, well, why'd you trade Bear? Or, or, or something that says, you know, what's going on with the power play? You know, we're, we're, fix the goaltending. You know, and, oh, and right. I think that right. that, I, I think that's a revelation for these guys. And I think that uh, what we've seen in the last three years is that in, in, in many ways, Kenny has remained consistent, which is really good. Some guys can't take that pressure, Bob, to come to Canada. You know, I, no. dare I say the guy, the, the, the guy he really replaced, Peter Shirelli, had a difficult time with it, had a difficult time with the limelight. You know, 20 years ago, John Ferguson, Jr., uh, was was you know named the general manager of the Maple Leafs had a difficult time understanding that you know uh, when he's going through the shopping mall and people are yelling at him why are they yelling at him well it's because it's the Toronto Maple Leafs and people love That's their right. team and they care so Kenny has been able to adapt to that I think really well in Edmonton and there's a ton of criticism in Edmonton you know why you know this week it's why did you sign Duncan Keith he wouldn't get vaccinated until you made him. You know, yeah. there's lots of there's lots of things that people bitch and complain about uh, that Kenny seems to have adapted pretty well to working in a Canadian market. I'm not going to sit here and tell you I have any idea how many passionate hockey fans there are in Detroit. There are plenty, but yes. if there's a hundred thousand of them in Detroit, there's five hundred thousand of them in Edmonton, and yeah. and the point of difference is, as you mentioned, it's not so much when you're in the arena. Because all the fans that are in the building are fans. Um, it's when you're not in the arena. And those extra 400,000 do creep up on you, if you yeah. will. And, uh, and a, guy like Ken, a guy like Kenny, um, again, I, I have biases. I've known him for ages. Uh, a guy like Kenny will always give you time. He will always give you time to explain why he's done it, what he's done, and what's going to happen next. He's pretty thorough in that. And the, he's also one of those guys, like Scotty is, yep. at a certain point in the conversation, he say, well, what do you think? Because he, he's yeah. always wanting information. 
He yeah, always the, wants those information. Are the, those are the guys that succeed. Pat Gillick was one of those guys too. Uh, we'll take the break. When we come back, Ken Holland, general manager, Edmonton Oilers, back after this. McCown and Shannon uh, with you. And um, joining us from roadside, somewhere between Edmonton and Calgary, is uh, the general manager of the Edmonton Oilers, Ken Holland, who is with us, who is on his way to Calgary to see, I gather for the first time, um, your latest grandchild, uh, a boy. Um, but Mr. Holland has, uh, Mr. Holland's family has been extremely prolific of late. He has eight <laughs> grandchildren, um, with a ninth coming in a couple of weeks. Are you, are you exhausted? Are you tired? Do you know any of their names? Do you remember their names? <laughs> yeah, I know a few of the names. Yeah. Uh, Friday night, uh, our, our, uh, one of our daughters had a uh, baby boy. So, uh, Last night after the game, we played Calgary. Dave Tippett gave everybody today today off, so I decided that uh, I'd get my first look at uh, our eighth grandchild. So I'm excited here. Uh, so I pulled off on the road here, halfway between Calgary and Edmonton, and do this interview, and then I'll get down and spend the day uh, with my daughter and our grand new grandson, and back to back to Edmonton tomorrow morning. Well, we will try and keep you as uh, as short a period of time as we possibly can. We greatly appreciate or, it. Or maybe maybe not. Maybe you know, you know, the, the magic of being a grandparent is be able to give the baby back at a certain point, right? Yeah. Uh, to... Yeah. At least I don't have any night work. That's up to my daughter to get up in the middle of the night. Uh, <laughs> my wife Cindy and I did our the, we did our uh, the, the, paid our dues and raising our four kids. So it's somebody else's turn. Well, you and you also said when you, you, six years ago you had uh, no grandchildren, and um, and now you're going to have nine. That are, are they going to stop at some point, or or you know, are you going? To, are you heading for double digits at least? <laughs> yeah, we've got four children, and uh, you said I was 59 years old. We had no grandchildren in the last uh, six years. Uh, we've got eight. Number nine's coming in the middle of November. So, uh, and our youngest son's getting married next July. So I'm sure he'll. Uh, he and his wife will um, have some, so I, I'm, I'm assuming we're going to get <laughs> double digits. Well, we, uh, we congratulate you and wish you good luck. And um, as I said previously, and in, in just trying to remember all the names. Um, <laughs> so I want to start on something a little bit um, curious, perhaps uh, not really about your team, but more generic. Uh, we have seen the national football league reduce their number of preseason games. Um, and we know that the motivation is perhaps different because it's purely economical really but there is a reality here that preseason games in any sport are of the least interest to the fans and i'm wondering whether you think they are worthwhile you just came off a season where you played no preseason games you didn't play uh any do anything other than the team practice beforehand have we gotten into a situation here kenny where just because it's been done this way for so long, we just accept it. And maybe it isn't worth the, the time, the trouble. Uh, it's interesting. You say that I mean, we, we were talking last night after the game, uh, I think Bob Nicholson and a few, uh, we, I was talking, I think in 2005, we, we used to have a 20, uh, 28 day training camp. Um, and I remember we didn't play any preseason games the first week and now, now training camp has been reduced from 28 days to 21. And by day three, you can have uh, preseason games. So, you know, it really speaks to the, uh, our athletes, their commitment in the off season, when they come to training camp, they're, uh, they're ready to roll. Now I do think you do need some preseason games. I don't know. We play eight this year. I'm not sure what the number is probably reduced from there. You know, you, you, you do like to have the opportunity to look at some of your um, young players to play some some games. Um, I think the, the vets probably like to play, you know, two to four. Um, so, you know, I think in the NFL, they reduced the preseason and added on one more regular season. I think they went That's from right. 16 regular season to 17 regular season. So they, they took the one preseason and made it a regular season game. But um, I'm, 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 uh, I, I, again, we play eight games because we're allowed to. And it's an opportunity to play uh, lots of young players and some some players that play in the American League that might not otherwise get a chance to to to, to give them an opportunity to see what they can do and have them feel good about themselves as they uh, head down to the American League team. 
But you've been but doing many, this a long time. How uh, I don't know, John may be about to ask the same question. How many times over the course of your career has somebody impressed you enough during a preseason game to actually make the difference and make the team? And I mean, impress you during a game rather than his, his you know, the practices that you have. Well, really, there's, there's very few opportunities. I think most teams go to training camp. If you're going to carry 23, which is the limit, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, 21 or 22 are almost on the team before you go to training camp. So there's, exactly. there's a, there's a spot open. You know, I would, I would look, uh, you know, I would say this year in, in preseason, we played uh, six preseason games. Uh, Brendan perlini has got five goals, you know, so, you know, he's a player that we signed, obviously uh, he's been around pro hockey you know, he's, he's made a, a real statement and a real case here in preseason to try to get on the um, opening day roster. If we had no preseason games, probably uh, we, we, we might have a different decision. So, but, but the reality, Bob, is I think it's an opportunity for maybe one person. You know, it's not like you're going to come to camp and five or six people are going to force their way onto the team. And you, well, yeah. we do all those, we make all those decisions in the off season. Of course. And that, and that Kenny is exactly what my point is. Is you know, uh, and and those decisions that you're going to make, whether it's one player, two players, however many, could you not make those through practice sessions without having to go through all these games? And that, and as you also said, the players come to camp now in shape. You know, training camp we all know historically was where the guys got to, into shape. Not anymore. They're ready to go. And you know, no, what you're right. I'm, I'm I'm agreeing with you. I think you know. I think again. I. I uh... If my memory serves me correct, I think in the 05, 06, you know, 04, 05 there, when we had the, the work stoppage, we used to have 28 days and nine games. They mm -hmm. preseason games allowed. They reduced it from 28 days to 21. So a week was cut off a training camp. We reduced it from nine preseason games to eight. You know, we, we, we play eight. But, you know, if you played, I, I think you probably need four preseason games for sure. You know, the game, the, everybody likes to play a couple of games before uh before the real games start but you know do you need eight probably you don't need eight it, it's it's but again it's it's an opportunity i think uh, bob moore it's about you know we just sent down philip broberg he's our first round pick from two years ago i think he played four preseason games and you know it's an opportunity for evan bouchard who didn't play a lot of hockey last year he was on our team i think he played 10 games out of the 56 he's playing almost every preseason game so preseason it's 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 not for the established players. It's more for young players um, to get some experience before they go down to show what they can do. And then again, maybe um, one player to force his way onto the roster by having a good preseason. The the uh, sorry, John. Uh, the the dilemma you must face is how do you quantify the performance of a young player when, for the most part, you would acknowledge that the competition that they are facing is just a drizzle of NHL talent. And most of it is talent that these guys will have played, if they played in the minors, they will have faced on an ongoing basis. How do you quantify a performance? A guy goes out, as you said, scores five goals in, in preseason, but how many of them are against real NHL competition? Well, you know, most of the rosters in the first week are probably half and half. You know, they're, they're half NHL players. You know, there's, there's, there's limits now. You have to have, uh, you know, minimum of eight and they got to meet a criteria. Um, so the first week it's half and half. You know, how do you quantify it? I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. you would quantify it the best we, we, we can. Um, and then, you know, if, if we like what they do the first week, they might be here for the second week. Now, the way our preseason games worked out, we played five games the first week and we've only got three games this week. So, uh, you know, we, we basically cut down to 15, eight and three. We're almost, uh, we, have, we have to let a goalie, one defenseman and one forward go by, uh, by Sunday. So uh, coach Tippett wanted to get down to the team the last week, he wants to work on systems sure. and the last three preseason games. He wants to, last night we played Calgary. It was almost, you know, was pretty close to both teams, you know, maybe a player missing on each team or two max. So it was a good game to evaluate, but it was really our teams. It wasn't, it wasn't a lot of young players. So it's, it's hard to quantify, but uh, it's, it's another opportunity to look at a, at a young player and more. So I don't know. It's a, it's an opportunity for us to evaluate and quantify. I think it's more the other way around. It's for the young players 
you know, last week uh, we have some young defense with Nemo Line and uh, Camp uh, Broberg, Berglund. It's 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 an opportunity for them to get their feet wet at a at a at a level, pro professional level that's above the American League. And when you're leaving Europe, uh, or you're leaving junior, leaving college, it's 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 obviously a, a bigger step than the leagues that they played in. It's a chance for them to, I use the word, get their feet wet, you know, even just for a few games to give them some information as to what they need to do to to, to become an NHL regular. Kenny, how would you describe the journey that you and uh, uh, Josh Archibald have gone through the last three or four weeks? Well, it's been tough. I mean, uh, you know, on, on, uh, you know, Archie came here and he immediately had to uh, go into quarantine for two weeks. You know, so when he crossed the border, he was in, uh, you know, he was with his family in Nebraska all summer. Um, crossed the border, immediately went into two weeks of quarantine. Um, you know, certainly had talked to him, knew that he, um, you know, didn't want to get vaccinated, um, was really, planning on when he come out of uh, quarantine to to sit down with them and and, and uh, talk to him and while he was in quarantine near the end the last four or five days he got really ill uh, lost a lot of weight um, and got some type of a viral infection and then when he got out of quarantine he started to skate the first couple of days on his own and just felt that he there was something wasn't right so then we spent the next four or five days putting him through a battery of tests and uh, eventually found out that he's got uh, myocarditis. So um, it's been tough. It's been real tough. Uh, it's a tough situation, obviously, uh, you know, from a health standpoint. And then obviously, uh, um, you know, as I, as I said in my opening press conference, you know, we looked at the calendar for being a Canadian team and having an unvaccinated player and crossing the border multiple times was going to make it very, very difficult to, uh, for Josh to, to have any kind of an impact on the team. But obviously we never got there because he didn't even, he didn't even get out of quarantine before, and, and he started to get uh, very sick. So, so what's the prognosis then? I mean, not many people understand what myocarditis is and, uh, and, and how long it takes to get over it, if, if at all. Well, my understanding, again, you know, John, you know, I'm not a doctor, you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a hockey administrator. Um, my understanding is, so if, if, if it comes over, I, my understanding is it's some type of an inflammation, um, either on or around the heart. Hmm. Um, you do get over it. Um, it does take some time. Um, I think it takes... It could take anywhere from one to one to three months. Uh, again, it's an inflammation, and uh, obviously because it's around the heart, it's very serious. And while you've got it, you cannot, um, you know, put a lot of pressure, stress on your heart. So that's why you just got to wait for, um, for lack of a better word, the inflammation. I'm going to use the word inflammation, but again, I'm not a I'm, I'm not a doctor to run its course, and then uh, and then. Um, then they can get up and running. So it's gonna, it's gonna. We we have no time frame. We have no time frame. But it, but I know we're talking. Uh, you know, we're not talking a week or two. We're we're talking a month or two or three. Have the doctors indicated to you, Kenny, whether um, his positive COVID test um, impacted on this? Was this the cause? Did they think? Well, they don't know. It certainly could be. But he also had that. Um, they gave me some long word gastro something or other, but he had, when he was in, um, when he was in quarantine, he got uh, some other type of an illness. So hmm. either, uh, either could have caused it. Um, they, the doctors tell me, you know, even if he was vaccinated, even vaccinated people can also get um, myocarditis. So it's not like if you get vaccinated, sure. you, you don't get it. It's, uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's um, obviously it's a very serious situation. And, uh, you know, anytime you're dealing with somebody's, somebody's hurt. Um, I got vaccinated as fast as I was able to. I know you did too, Kenny. You, you yep. got your, you and your family got, you got your vaccines right away as soon as you were eligible. John, I'm, I'm, I'm 99.9% .9 sure you were the same. Mm -hmm. 
it is difficult for me to understand how, what reasons somebody gives for not getting vaccinated. But you have to, but, but I don't deal with them. You have to. You've got, had uh, at least a couple of players, including um, Duncan Keith, who you had to deal with that situation with. What kind of reasoning do they give? And is it, uh, can you possibly be sympathetic to it? Um, you know, I, obviously, first order, I, I, you know, it's personal choice. Um, and I'm with you. I mean, I, I, I think I said at the press conference, we, my wife and I couldn't wait to, in March when the, the, the 60s, we're in our 60s, could go get vaccinated. We went and get vaccinated and we're anxious for fall here to go get a booster shot. So uh, I'm with you. You know, I, I we've got vaccinated and, and the very first opportunity we're, we're in there getting uh, getting our vaccinations and can't wait to get our booster shot. So, um, you know, obviously it's personal choice. And then they, they I think, they, you know, you talk to, they talk to a lot of people and gather their own information. Certainly, I mean, I, I, I you know, there's a difference of opinion i can't understand they probably can't understand why i'm getting vaccinated and i can't understand why they're not getting vaccinated but certainly i'm uh, i believe in in, in uh, all the medical information and 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 everybody is is the, the governments and everybody's saying you should get vaccinated and and um, i did it as fast as i could it's frustrating at times really when you consider that we're supposed to be talking hockey and it always circles back to vaccinations, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the world we live in. Obviously, times uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, you know, in March of 2019, all, uh, all our worlds changed. So, um, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's different times. So, uh, speaking of Duncan, how's he looked? Well, he played his first game last night. He came out of quarantine on, um, on uh, Friday. So he's been on, was on the ice Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and played last night. So, you know, he's been in quarantine for 14 days. You know, he's, he's a guy, uh, you know, he was in Edmonton just before uh, he, you know, he'd come from Penticton, come to Edmonton for, for a few days. Um, he's not a big guy to, he said he's now always never been a big guy to skate in the, uh, you know, in July and August. So he hasn't been on the ice very much. You know, he was on the ice for, few days then he went into then he made the decision to go get the uh, to us to get the johnson and johnson vaccine and then have to come back and quarantine for two weeks so and he's probably only been on the ice total total almost a week so uh you know be, uh, it looked thought he looked fine last night you know he'll, he'll play again thursday i would anticipate he'll play our last two preseason games and you know he, he's going to need the next 10 days of practicing and playing to get himself uh, to get himself ready for opening night is he? Do you, do you anticipate he'll be able to play the vast majority of your, of games this year? I mean, I don't know whether he plays eighty two, but um. well, I would think so. I mean, I you know I've talked to him. I you know I um, you know he, he wants to. I mean, he's. I think I you know I think I think Bob. You know, he made a decision for personal reasons and professional reasons that he he wanted to come out west and personally to be closer to his son i think professionally he wanted uh, you know a new challenge and i think you know and then and then he obviously made a decision to get vaccinated so that that uh, you know he can he doesn't have to deal with the cross borders and you know i kind of walked through the calendar with with him so i think he's made decisions over the last uh, 3 4 months that would indicate that he wants to be in there every night and uh, he wants to be uh, an important piece of, uh, of our team. Um, you're, you're well aware that in this new era of sport, the concept of resting players almost in every sport is um, not uncommon. In fact, it's become quite common, perhaps less so in the National Hockey League than in other sports. I think the Toronto Blue Jays, for example, had one player play 162 games. That was Semyon. Um, Football slightly different. Basketball, very few players play um, a full 82-game schedule. How do you feel about that? How do you feel about the notion of there being an advantage to resting players, even significant players, um, not necessarily on a regular basis, but periodically over the course of the year? Do you think there's advantage in that? Well, I, absolutely. The answer is yes. Now, I think what's happened, you know, certainly, you know, there's a mandatory um, in, the, in the collective bargaining agreement, 
every week. There's one mandatory off day in seven. Um, but on top of that, I, I think, you know, 15 years ago, Bob, practices were, were an hour and a half. You know, mm -hmm. hour and 15 to an hour and a half. Practices now are 45 to 50 minutes. They, right. I've had different coaches. You know, practices are probably a half an hour shorter than they were 10, 10, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And I also think that that uh, the coaches now, all the coaches give those players that play, you know, uh, lots of minutes, they get extra day off here, here and there. So I think we try to do in our sport, um, things to have our best players field our best lineup on an every day, um, but giving them more shortening practices, um, you know, keeping track of their workload. You know, the trainer, the train, the training, training staff will tell uh, Dave Tippett, uh, you know, you think you better back off on this player, or you should give the team an extra day off. So we try to do things to um, um, keep them fresh because to play at their best they need to be fresh. They can't be worn down. They can't be, can't be tired. So, you know, in our sport right now, I think that the philosophy is that we want to ice our best roster. Um, does that change three, four, five years from now? I don't know. I think, I think because of the salary cap, because of the race to the playoffs, because how difficult it is to make the playoffs, you know, and there's photo finishes to get in, you know, you make or miss the playoffs by, three, four, five points. I, I think for the most part, the philosophy in our sport is to dress your best lineup as often as you, as you can. Yeah, I get that, Kenny. I, I mean, uh, and John will, will, you'll forgive me because John's heard this speech a few times. Maybe you have too, but um, I would have a, a, a significant understanding if, if you said philosophically, you believe that a forward or a defenseman should not play 82 games that you should give them a few days off, like actually miss games, forget practices, actually take a few games off over the course of the season. And yet, and that doesn't happen all hardly at all. A, a guy doesn't play if he's hurt really is, is essentially it, or it's late in the season and there's a nothing game in the last week. And yet at the same time, um, I'm reminded of this because I, I was, I picked up my phone this morning and saw a picture of 90 year old Glenn Hall uh, with, I think, 77 year old Bernie Perrant. I may be wrong on Bernie's age, <laughs> um, but, but Glenn, I think, is 90 and still around. He played around, 500, Ed around Edmonton, around Edmonton, you know, yep. played 502 consecutive games. What is with the um, the wussy goaltenders that we have in the National Hockey League right now? where if you play 65, you should, you, 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 they think you should be exhausted. I think, you know, at the end of the day, it's communication. I, I, I think that the, certainly the coaches I've dealt with, Dave Tippett, Mike Babcock, um, you know, the, 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 those would be the Jeff Blaschel. Right. They, they talk to the players, you know, I, like, I don't think that Dave Tippett's just going to sit out and, and healthy scratch one of our star players on his own, he's going to talk to that star player and say, you know, you played a lot of minutes. We've played a lot of games. We're playing six games in nine nights. We've been in all these things. Uh, your, your, the training staff says that your numbers, that you've got a big workload. Um, and then it, the, the player's going to be involved in that decision. So I, sure. I think that right now our players, they want to play. Like they, they, they want to play. I, I, that's even the case in the preseason. Like I, I, I asked tip the other day, you know, I, what are your plans with Connor and Leon and, and some of the guys, you know, the last three, four preseason games. And he said, you know, Ken, I'm going to talk to our players here. You know, they're going to play Monday. They want to play Thursday. And then I'm going to regroup and talk to them on Friday and see, do they want to play the last preseason game or do they want to take it off? So it's, you know, it's not like the coach that says you're not playing the last preseason game. It's, 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 it's the decisions are made you know, with the, with the player and, and, and our players, they, they, the mentality is that they want to play, but certainly it's based upon, you look at the schedule, you know, you look at the amount of games, you look at their workload, the minutes played, you know, if somebody's playing the bottom part of the roster and they're a forward and they're playing eight to 10 minutes, they probably want to play every game. You know, I think you're talking about star players. And I think that that's a, a decision that's made by the coach and the player and the training staff all, all together. All right. So what about goaltenders though? So 
you got a goaltender plays maybe 65 games during a regular season. Now you get to the playoffs. If you have four consecutive seven game series, Kenny, now you're going to ask that guy in all likelihood to play 28 consecutive games. How does that make sense? That's a, well, that's, last a time, that's a good problem the to have. Time, Bob, the last time I <laughs> well, had yeah. a 60 game, go- the last the last time I had a 60 game goalie, I think was I'm trying as you're talking. I was probably uh, 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 Dominic Hasek, probably you know you know 20, 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, 20, since then, you 2002. know, since, you know, yeah, 2002. You know, I had we had Osgood and Legacy, and it was Osgood and Hasek, and then it was Osgood and Howard, and then it was, you know, I you know so now I've got Smith and Koskinen. Um, you know, I I, I think. It looks like the number one goalies play 60 games, you know, 60 to 65. They still yeah. have 15 to 17 off. And then, you know, in our case here in Edmonton, Mike Smith and Smitty played 32, I think, of the last 45 last year. But it was a different schedule. The, 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 we'd go into yeah, yeah. Uh, on the road. We'd play sit in the same city for two games. But, you know, again, I think I think that that is, that is really based upon if you've got a number one goalie, how you feel and, and how's he playing? Well, you can tell when the players are getting tired, you know, like, you know, as an example, Bob, last night after the game, you know, Dave Tippett said to me, Ken, he said, I, I thought we looked tired in the first period. He said, I put him through a really demanding practice on Sunday and we were going to have a practice today, Tuesday. And he decided last night at 1030 after the game, he's given the team off because he thought the team needed, they, they needed the rest rather than the practice. So I think it's, it's the, you make these decisions on a day-to-day basis based upon the information that, that we get in watching the games and talking to our training staff and talking to the, whether you make a decision to give the team a day off or you make a decision to give a player a day off. You talk to the player, you talk to the leadership group, and you make those decisions based upon everyday feedback. Before we go to break, um, can, he, can a 41-year-old goalie play 65 games? No. So how many do you think Mike will play? Well, I mean, I think if you told me that he'd play, uh, you know, it starts with a four, you know, whether it's yeah. 41 or 49. You know, I think it's, I, I think that that's the number. I think, uh, you know, we're, it's, we're a two goalie team, you know, two years ago uh, in the pandemic, I think we played 72 games. I, I think they both played the same amount of games. I think they both played around 36. Um, you know, last year it, it ended up that Mike Smith played the, he was the number one guy, but I don't see that this year. Not with when, not when you look at the schedule and we're in Arizona one night and we're in, we're in uh, Vegas the next night. Uh, you, you need two goalies, so we're we're a two goalie team, and I think that Mike Smith. I think his number starts with a four, whether it's forty to forty nine. That's what I, you know, if we if you take injuries out, I can't read into injuries, but I think if both guys are healthy all year, you know, it's either fifty uh, fifty or, you know, does Mike Smith play a few more games based upon the way he played last year? But I think it starts with a four. Let's take a quick break. Uh, Ken Holland is with us. He's uh, roadside between Calgary and uh, Edmonton. And uh, we'll come back and chat some more after these messages. McCowan, Shannon, Ken Holland, the general manager of the um, Edmonton Oilers. Uh, Zach Hyman was on with us when, John? About two weeks ago? Something like that? Yeah, about that. About that. Just before camp started. Yeah, we had a chance to uh, have a lengthy chat with him. It was before camp started, as John mentioned. So... Um, give me your give me your impressions of what you've seen of him f- close up and uh, day after day, and is he what you thought he was? Well, I mean, first off, John I, I, Bob, we played Toronto nine times last year, and, and so you know, <laughs> you so, got a chance you know, to see him a we lot. Got, we got a real good look at him for, for first hand, and he, he scored potted some goals against us, and he was a, he was a handful. So, um, you know, obviously made the decision to uh, pursue him and um uh, and then sign him you know in, in the first two weeks of training camp a lot of will a lot of hard work a lot of determination uh lots of drive to the hard areas to the blue paint um lots of forechecking uh, lots of protecting of the puck um and i think he's going to be very very valuable for us he can play left wing he can play right wing he obviously can play in the p- penalty kill you know, and I, I think that, you know, in, in the decisions that I made, we made over the course of the offseason, you know, up front, 
Um, we wanted to add a little more size. Uh, we wanted to add players that would go to the paint more. Um, and, you know, th that's, you know, the additions of Fogel, the additions of uh, Zach Hyman. We wanted to be a little more tenacious, a little more determined. Derek Ryan is a guy that's, you know, pursues the puck. So uh, those are the dimensions, the, 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 the things that I think Zach Hyman is going to bring to our team. And, and he's uh, on an everyday basis. Uh, and, and, and on top of that, I think, a tremendous attitude you know he's he I mean, you guys have been around you saw him in Toronto I mean he's he's always positive he's upbeat and um, loves to come to the rink and I think it's it's contagious and I think that the, the things that I just talked about are going to rub off on on some of the other players on our team you know the the other guy that uh, hasn't received much uh, uh, acknowledgement is when you acquired uh, Warren Fogel Fogel changes a little bit of the personality of your team too, doesn't he? Yeah, I mean, he can really skate. He gets in on the forecheck. Um, he, he'll go to the, again, he goes to the blue paint. Um, he's a big guy, six foot two. So, you know, I think, again, obviously made the, the deal, uh, Ethan Bear for, uh, for, for Fogel. I, you know, I, we wanted to get deeper up front, you know, and, 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 and and get some secondary, a little bit of secondary scoring, but not only secondary scoring, just to be a little bit, little bit bigger, you know, and, and uh, a little bit heavier and a little bit harder. And, you know, uh, that, that's why the deals were made. So, you know, certainly Fogel's a big guy, he gets skates, he gets in on the four check, you know, in the early going, he's got uh, Fogel with uh, Zach Cassian and, and Derek Ryan. I'm, I'm sure as we go through the year, you know, some of this will, will, will switch, but uh um, just, I think there's more options. I'd like to think that, that the moves we made in the off scene is going to give Dave Tippett a few more options. Um, and then if you have some injuries, a little more depth to try to, to again, to be a little bit of a, a different, better team. Ahead, when this, uh, so when you get, took this job, you were in cap hell. I don't think there was any question about it. Do you think you're out of cap hell now? Well, I think everybody's in cap hell. I, I think, you know, John, you know, I, I think you're always in cap hell. I, I just think that, 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 that other than maybe, you know, out of 32 teams, 25, you know, 25 are up against it. You know, if, when you're trying to win, you, everybody snuggles their way up to, uh, you know, a million and a half or $2 million below the cap. What makes ours a little more difficult is we go into, um, LTI with the cleft bomb situation. When you go into LTI, you don't accrue any space, which means when you get to the salary at the trade deadline, you haven't, you know, the million dollars under the cap um, in a normal year can grow to almost $4 million. You know, you can acquire a player, the million dollars when you're in LTI is still a million dollars. You don't mm -hmm. accrue space. So it, it affects it, the LTI situation affects the way you, uh, the way we run our team. But uh you know, we're tight. I mean, we're, we're, we're tight. And I obviously made some decisions, you know, I made a decision with Darnell Nurse, who's going to be an unrestricted free agent or was going to be an unrestricted free agent. Um, you know, when you just start to see all the defensemen signed, certainly his number is going to go up uh, dramatically. So I, I just think that you're, everybody is, is you're always in, you're always going to be stressed to, 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 to the, to the limit. in if, in, in, if you're trying to win in a, in a, in a cap world. And that's why, uh, drafting and developing and young players coming through the system that play uh, on entry level contracts and finding, you know, those cheap veterans on the, on the market that are looking for an opportunity are big pieces to being a successful team. That leads to, that leads to two questions about two players. Um, even Dave Tippett now is saying how important Devin Bouchard is to the future of this organization because he didn't play very much last year, as you alluded to. Where, where do you see Bouchard's development? And then I got to ask you about Dylan Holloway too. Well, I mean, you know, Bush is, I mean, obviously he was the, what, the 10th pick in the draft, uh, you know, big time point producer and junior, um, had a real good rookie year in the American Hockey League. Um, you know, he's a skilled guy. He's, he's a right shot guy that can move the puck. He's got a big shot. And I think like most young defensemen has spent the last, uh, the first two years of pro hockey, which was uh, in, in, in um, uh, two years ago, he was in Bakersfield and last year was on our taxi squad. You know, he's learned to, you know, defend, you know, the, I think most young defensemen have to learn to defend. So you know, he's going to be in the lineup every, every day this year. 
Um, he's 22 years of age, and uh, certainly we need him to grow grow into a, a really important uh, player on this team going going forward. So you know, any young player that's got high high ceiling, which Evan Bouchard has, are important players to uh, to their team. So uh, Evan's very important. Dylan Holloway, um, you know, broke his scaphoid in February in his uh, Big Ten college playoffs. Had surgery, um, and over the course of the summer, um, we took regular pictures of him, and it really got to the point where it was not healing. It got to be about 30% healed, sat there for like six to eight weeks. Um, they gave him a stem. They tried to, to do things to, to, you know, the last thing you want to do is do another surgery, but ultimately a decision was made in uh, early early September that they had to really redo surgery and do a little bit of a different surgery. Um, he was actually with Edmonton yesterday. Uh, the doctor had pictures. The doctor looked at it. Everybody uh, seems to be pleased with um, where he's at at this point in time. He's spent the last couple of weeks in Calgary at home because he, he was not allowed to work out. They didn't want him to, to, to sweat and, 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 and uh, have to do things with, uh, you know, we're going very, very um, conservative. He's now been green lighted to uh, come to Edmonton. And uh, he's going to be in Edmonton for the next couple of months rehabbing. And I'm hoping that, you know, sometime in, in December or January that he's going to be uh, to back playing. But we're going to be very, very conservative because he's, he's 19, he turns 20 here after September 15th being a late birthday. So he's just, just turning 20 years old and he's very, very important. Another very, very important uh, player to this organization. So uh, when you say back playing, I would assume that's in Bakersfield? Yeah, I mean, he hasn't played pro hockey. It wouldn't be fair right. to all of a sudden just put him in the NHL. I would, I would think, you know, he's probably going to, you know, I, I think, John, you know, the hope was after he left um, the World Junior and he went back and he finished really strong. He was almost two points a game in the college season. You know, the, the hope, you know, the plan was at that point in time in February and March that, you know, uh, take Wisconsin on a run. Let's put you into Bakersfield. Let's finish the year in Bakersfield. Get your feet wet and play pro hockey. Come to training camp this year in September, and let's see if you can uh, if Dylan Holloway could could make the Edmonton Oilers. Um, and all that all that has been uh, timeline has been obviously totally changed. So right. I would say to you right now, it's going to be probably this year. Finish the year in Bakersfield. He's got to play some pro games. They're not fair for a twenty year old that's never played pro hockey coming off. You know he's. We're going to go from February when he played his last game. He's going to, yeah. it's going to be 10 to 12 months between games. He's, he's 20 years old. Can't step in the national hockey league and play in the national hockey. League. He's going to go to the, the only, American league and get to play the pro. The only reason I ask that is, you know, how Oiler fans are when they see a young kid and there, there's an expectation that this guy can be the next great winger. And so uh, well, that's, why, that's, why, that's why, that's why, that's why I'm lowering expectations, giving everybody <laughs> a realistic timeline and, and wanting to give uh, any young player, Dylan Holloway or any young player, the, the appropriate time that they need to, um, to, to, to be, you know, to, to be fuller, reach their potential. Yeah. Well, uh, before we let you go, uh, John and I were chatting before you uh, came on and he suggested that one of the challenges that faced you when you went to Edmonton was, um, you needed to improve the depth in the organization. And um, clearly you have done that. And uh, um, it appears successfully. Um, do you sense that that was one of your greatest challenges? Yeah, you know, I'm going to tell you what I told our guys on, uh, you know, the, 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 the opening meeting. You know, when I got the job in May of 2019, they, they you know, the previous year, I think they'd finished 28th. The team had finished 28th in the regular season. But the year before, they had, uh, or a couple of years earlier, they made the playoffs. You know, we finished 12th overall. We finished 11th overall the last two years. Um, obviously, we've made additions. I think that our team under Coach Tippett is really, we've defended better. You know, we, we, we were mm -hmm. second and eighth in the league in penalty killing the last two years when I think the previous years they were around 30th or 31st. I think we've defended better. We've kept the puck out of our net. You know, you don't win six five and seven six. You gotta you gotta defend. So I think that our team under Coach Tippett, you know, we've 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 competed, and certainly with the moves that we made, you know, the goal is to obviously off the bat be in the playoffs, and mm -hmm. 
um, compete with the best teams in the in the Western Conference to try to try to, to try to open at home. I think that's that's you know if to open at home, you got to be in the top four four teams in the Western Conference. But you know we we haven't been able to do that the last two years. So uh, it's it's to grow and build upon what we've accomplished over the last two previous seasons and take another step forward. Nobody handicaps things more than you do on a daily basis. You're the second best team in the Pacific. Well, let me hear people talk about that, but you got to play 82 games, John. I think we feel, I think we feel good. I think our team feels good about ourselves, you know, since, since December the 31st, you know, I, I guess, I guess, you know, the message that I tried to send our team is, you know, we've, we've, we've played at a relatively pretty good regular season level over the last two years and over the last, you know, since December the 31st, we were tied with Toronto and Pittsburgh at having the sixth best winning percentage in the National Hockey League on the last half of the 1920 season and this 56 game schedule. So we've, we've obviously, we, we, ha it hasn't translated into playoff success. We lost to Chicago in a play in and we lost last year in a sweep to Winnipeg, but you, in order to go on a playoff run, you got to make the playoffs. And mm -hmm. it's hard to make the playoffs. Half the league misses the playoffs. So, you know, I think that the message is we've played at a high level, but everybody around the league thinks that they've made moves to make their team better. We think we've made moves to, to make our team better. And we got to continue to focus on, you know, doing the things that you need, being better defensively, making sure we continue to be good on the special team, certainly on the penalty kill. You know, we've been number one in the league in the power play the last two years. Find some chemistry. Uh, try to get a little bit deeper and get a little bit of secondary scoring. Have some young players make a, you know, I'd look at Jesse Pugliarvi who looks uh, like he's he's kind of picking up where he left off here in preseason from last year. And and we talked about Evan Bouchard and Kyler Yamamoto and McLeod. And behind the scenes, we need the Brobergs and the and the Holloways uh, to to kind of grow and develop into uh, to NHL players. So it's it's obviously the focus is on the big team, but in order for our the big team to eventually continue to grow and get better, part of it is part of it is, is the additions that we make. Part of it's got to be the growth of the players on the team, and part of it's got to be that behind the scenes that we are developing another group of players or some players that can come and have some impact um, on our team going forward. Uh, listen, grandpa, we're going to let you go. Um, <laughs> you got an, a, a grandson to meet, um, down yep. the road. So safe drive. And thanks as always, um, for, uh, for, uh, joining us on the program and, and especially considering uh, the circumstances. Well, uh, no the other thing is, the other thing, Bob is, is we know that Kenny's come got, got to come back on in November, uh, before he goes into the hockey hall of fame. So, you know, we're booking him right now for the hockey hall of fame week. It'll be our it's Okay, honor. I enjoy your talking to you guys. I love your passion. <laughs> All the best, Kenny. Thanks, Safe guys. drive. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> the general manager of the Edmonton Oilers, Ken Holland, back after these. Well, we always thank our, uh, our guest at the beginning of the final segment, and uh, we certainly want to thank Ken Holland. But, um, you know, guys driving from Edmonton to Calgary to see his eighth grandchild and pulls over on the side of the road to uh, talk to us for 40, 45 minutes. Uh, it would have been a real story if he kept driving, but that's not allowed. Well, we wouldn't want that, actually. No, no. no. We, want, we, want, we, we like having his attention. <laughs> but not, not everybody would do that. And so we are most appreciative uh, yeah. of uh, Mr. Holland's contribution. I thought it was interesting uh, that he, you know, there was a lot of, there's a lot of pressure on the goaltending in Edmonton, Bob. I, I, that uh, he, he thought that Mike Smith would, not play as many games as a lot of people assume Mike Smith will. I, I just well, thought that was fascinating. I, I think it's because, and I think he sort of stated this, that Mike Smith is what, 41 years old. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, look at Glenn Hall played 502 consecutive games, but he didn't do it when he was 41 years old. I don't think he might. No, have. he was No, 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 he didn't. But, you know, I mean, I get the age difference. You know, I mean, it just it's just that for a goaltender in his mid twenties who's established himself, I just don't understand. I say, well, he's tired. We got to give him 15, 20 games off, and then you get to the playoffs, and then you're going to play him every other night over and yeah. over and over again, and you're not going to give him a day off. You're not going to give him a game of rest. And besides which, I was a goaltender. It ain't that hard. So you yeah, hold on, hold on, hold on. You were you were with the Kineski pads, and you weren't allowed to go to your knees. 
No, uh, I went to my knees. The, po- the position has changed. The position has changed. Since no, the played. attitude, Gump, the Gump, position is Gump. exactly the same. The Gump attitude McCown. towards the position has changed. And they, it has changed. Uh, it's wrong. They're all nuts. <laughs> So the, actually, the, 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 the philosophy of goaltending has changed just like the philosophy of pitching in baseball has changed. And that's wrong, too. Okay. You know, I just don't understand why people won't listen to me when I tell them about these things. <laughs> well, they, we got to make sure they listen to the podcast. Got to get them to find the podcast. No reason why a pitcher can't throw 150 pitches in a night, and there's no reason why a goaltender can't play 82 consecutive games. If, I got a, if I'm a coach in the NHL, and I got one goaltender that's significantly better than the other, that second goaltender's ass is glued to that bench. It's not stapled. It's glued with something that he can. He, he, he ain't moving. I don't care if he's there through practices. He ain't going to play. My number one guy is going to play. And he ain't going to so, get tired. So you, you wouldn't be opposed to that 70-game goaltender anymore. The which we haven't seen one the a seven inning goal, goal a yeah. se, no a seven a seventy game goaltender we eighty haven't two seen one in a long time <laughs> you're giving a goaltender the night off it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever I've ever heard oh, of the world has changed back Are to you? back games and travel come on who gives a flying fado it's a goaltender he ain't skating anywhere he ain't getting tired during a game. If he gets oh. hurt, that's one thing. If he takes a puck off a noggin and it knocks him out cold, I'll give him a day off. Anything less than that, lace him up, pal. You're. Playing. I'm surprised. I'm surprised you even would allow for a backup to sit on the bench. I'm not happy about that. <laughs> I'd, I'd I'd rather get the guy who uh, runs drives the Zamboni, and how'd that work out? Well, all right, he, worked out okay. Won. Yeah, he won. There you go. <laughs> we gotta go. We'll see you tomorrow. Goodbye, everybody.